want to talk about the future of fabrication of materials, maybe even the Internet of Things. But this is the future of stuff that we make. And um, right now, we are making more and more things in more and more ways. Um, traditionally, that making has been mass manufacturing. Manufacturing almost entails in our mind's eye things done at a large scale. Endless conveyor belts of things. Huge vats. Large numbers. Big containers. And for many things that is true. That's exactly the way we make them and it's the most efficient way. But increasingly we make things in smaller numbers, smaller batches, um, more um, tinier um, controls and in um, smaller numbers than we have before. And sometimes, sometimes we even come down to making just one of things. And I think the general trend is, is we're going to continue to make things at mass scale, but we have the option of making things in smaller quantities. And it's the technologies that are now being used to make those things in smaller quantities that actually have the most promise. And some of them will actually be used to make things at large scale um, as they go along, but they will continue to unleash the bottom, so to speak, and unleash that area where we only need a couple of things. And there is a number of reasons why to make a few things instead of many, many, many things. Uh, foremost, um, uh, we want per to things to personalize. We want personalized things. We want things that are just made for me, for my particular use, for, 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 this, for this one need that I have right now, or for my particular body or shape or for my particular use. And, and there's many, many things where we have a very particular need. And it would be really great to be able to make something for that need. There's an, an, another way in which we um, make only a few things because we don't know what it is that we want. And so we are inventing it. Maybe we're making it for the first time. Maybe we're, we're altering something for the very first time. And there, this idea of it being kind of a prototype is very, very essential, particularly as we move into a world where innovation is becoming the norm. We are going to be doing more things for the first time. And so there we actually only want one or two or things. And we want them very quickly because we're probably going to go through a process of iteration where we make something, we try and use it, and then we alter it. We make a second thing, a different version of it, and we try that and we alter it. And that process of alteration through use is going to become quite the norm. And if we can do that very easily, it becomes very, very powerful. Okay, and so 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 the first the first reason to, to, to have short run manufacturing and fabrication is for personalization. And the second one is for innovation. And um, uh, both of those can kind of conspire where, where not just we make one thing, but we actually may want to have a niche product where maybe there's more than one person, there's 100 people, but that's all that's interested in it. And so instead of having to make thousands of things, we're going to make 100, and that suffice to this niche. So the increasing specialization of interest in the world also propels this idea of having short run uh, manufacturing because there may only be a thousand people in the entire world who want this one thing, but a thousand people would be sufficient to manufacture it. So if if we can make something um, work in a thousand units, we're happy. So that is a third kind of trend in the world of fabrication is this idea of the world's just basically going to be mostly niche markets. The niche markets may be fairly small. So the technologies that we're inventing that help us do these um, niche personalized prototypes are um, things like 3D printing, which we've all heard about. And 3D printing is an additive process where you 
add little bits of material and you build up what you want. And in, in the beginning, it was just plastic. And it was pretty cool for that because it can make shapes that you couldn't get to any other way. You couldn't mill it. You couldn't carve it. You couldn't cut it. The 3D printer often can make things, shapes, that you really couldn't make in any other way. It can make other kinds of shapes that you could mill. It can make them faster and it can make one ofs. But it, they're all in plastic. But that's kind of passed away very quickly and now you can 3D print in metal of almost any kind of metal you want. In fact, you can specify what kind of metal. And it's um, metal that's often been powdered and then the lasers will fuse it. Um, and then depending on how it's fused, it can actually be as strong as metal cast or milled, maybe even stronger in some cases. And so we can now make metal parts that could be made by milling, but you could make them maybe one of and faster. But more importantly, they can make shapes and parts that cannot be made any other way. And then we can also begin to make them with new kinds of materials. So not just plastic, not just metals, but now we can print foodstuffs. We can print tissues for the body. Um, really, and we can print concrete and make a building at large scale. So, so um, the amount of materials that we're using is, is expanding. And, and the latest one is in kind of multi-material printers or multicolors, and, and they can actually mix and match. So in the same way that a, a organism is made up of many different kinds of cell types, so you have bone and cartilage and nerves and skin, we can also print, 3D print in that same way where there's a layering, where there's multiple colors, multiple kinds of materials all mixed into the same unit. And that's extremely extremely powerful. Um, and then, of course, we're also changing the scale. In the beginning, you've probably heard about, you know, 3D printers that had a little tiny base. They were, they were making little tiny plastic things. But in fact, we can now print at the scale of a car. Um, there's airplane wings being printed. Um, there are whole homes being printed in concrete in the same way. So, so the scale of things has continued to expand and really, um, in theory, there, there, there's no limit to, to how big we could print something. Um, and that printing can be done at the finest resolution um, that we can imagine. And so um, this is no longer just kind of rough plastic. This is actually a viable, commercial, professional, highest quality level of fabrication. And so... Um, what this does is, is several things. One is that, again, while it was originally imagined for doing rapid prototyping, so if you want, a, you want, you have an idea, you make something, you make a drawing of it and you print it in 3D, and there it is. That was the original idea of rapid prototyping. And then there was a second additional value where you could have one of these in your home. So you could have it instantly in your home. You didn't have to go somewhere to get it. You didn't have to go down to the hardware store. You just print it. Particularly if you could print something that you could not buy anywhere. That was even more magical. But even if you were printing something you could buy, it was there next to you. Um, and then um, the other reasons was, well, you could then personalize it. It's again, I'm, I'm going to modify something to fit my use. I need this little handle and my hand is too small, so I'm going to change the shape of it when I print it. And so I have this personalized part or this personalized machine. Um, and now we kind of uh, expand that to many, many materials and we can have the state of the art. Again, we can have a piece that we could not get anywhere else. So um, what this does is that this also move into, you know, the world of manufacturing and um, commercial mass manufacturing because you could actually print many of these at once and in some cases because you're making things that cannot be made in, in, in another way you actually may be doing it faster than milling uh, it would be 
Okay, and the resin kind of the resin um, where they float in a resin reservoir, you can print multiple, multiple things at once as fast as you print one. And so therefore, this is actually a way to make lots of things at scale. And it's becoming much more commercial. So um, there are several things that this does. Um, one is that this um, makes inventory go away. It becomes digital inventory. So you don't actually have to, um, you have a file and whenever someone orders something, you bring that file in and you print it on demand. So you have an on-demand a manufacturing economy. Um, we also see a change in kind of flexible manufacturing where, where you don't have to set up multiple machines for this one run. You have basically the same machine printing many different kinds of parts, and so which can be changed very, very rapidly. So you have this idea of flexible manufacturing where an on-demand manufacturing, both of those giving great power, again, to having fewer runs, more diversity, more innovation. Um, and finally, I, I just um, want to emphasize again the way in which um, uh, the new tools for creating this are also improving. So something is made, by this way, by first making a virtual digital twin of it by using a CAD program, computer-aided design program, to actually make a digital version of it. And that digital version is then printed. But that digital version doesn't have to be made by, if it's a part that's known, it could be taken from a library. It's, in fact, it could be a library of all the screw parts and you could just take that, you find it, say, I want that one, and you send it to the printer. And whether it's your printer or someone else's, you get a copy of it. So you have this idea that you have this library, this catalog, of all these things, and for many of these things, once someone makes the CAD, the design, they don't have to do it again. They can, you can get one, or you could modify it. So this whole process of collecting these um, virtual digital twins of all these objects, and that becomes this basis to then do the modifications is a tremendous accent in, in accelerating the speed at which things are made. Um, and as more and more of the things in the world are made first digitally, that means that there is a larger and larger available library of objects, devices, that have already been designed and are available then to be improved or modified. Okay, and so that is really one of the second order consequences is that we have this manufacturing that's digital first and allow us all the advantages of the digital world of easy replication, easy duplication, easy modification, uh, easy improvement. And then you kind of feed it back. You make something, you put it back into the library, the new version of it, and someone else do it. So you have this accelerated innovation. And I think that um, uh, all these things conspire to a, a, a future of manufacturing that is digital first. Everything starts digitally. Um, it is often on demand. It's very, very flexible. And um, uh, it will continue to grow in its varieties of materials, the multiple materials, the scale, so that in some senses, um, even mass manufacturing is transformed by these innovations happening at the front of the on-demand manufacturing and fabrication. So for me, the future of fabrication um, is really being determined and innovated by trying to do one-ofs and rapid prototyping. So, so I think that the future of manufacturing and fabrication is really going to be a one of accelerated innovation.